Hey everyone, welcome. We're gonna go ahead and get started um, so that we can give Susanna um, all of her time. Welcome to uh, the fourth of fifth event, five events for the Juamet Leadership Conference. We're so happy that you all could be here. Um, we, I just want to quickly announce we have one more event. It's tomorrow at lunch at 12 o'clock in the Stratton Student Center. Uh, we'll be screening a documentary about the 1999 Status of Women in Science report that was done here at MIT, featuring interviews with some of the men and women who are actually involved in that committee. Um, and then we'll be following that up with a panel discussion from um, Chancellor Barnhart, Dean Ortiz, and some current MIT students. It should be a really great time. We hope you guys can make it. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Paula, who is the um, event chair for tonight's keynote address, and she will introduce our speaker. Thank you so much for being here. Hello. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, we're very happy to have here today Ms. Susana Malcorra. I'm going to just talk a little bit about her before we start. She was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Argentina, sorry, Spanish, um, where she graduated as an electrical engineer, and then she worked over 25 years in the private sector in both IBM and Telecom Argentina. And then at some point she did a substantial career shift and she joined the United Nations, first in the World Food Program, where, for example, she led the initial emergency response of the tsunami of Southeast Asia in 2004. Um, then she also spent part of her time in the Department of Field Support. And finally, in 2012, she, she was appointed by Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, as her, his chief of the cabinet, which um, for us that we're not experts in the UN terminology, more or less translates to being one of his closest aides for everything he needs and a representative of him everywhere in the world. Um, we're very happy to have her here today because she is a woman, a leader, of course, and also because she can bring to us scientists and engineers from MIT a totally new perspective uh, with um, having working in both so different sectors. So please join me and welcome Susana. Hello, good evening everybody. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks for having the great idea of inviting me to be here with you today. You know, when this week started and I realized that I was to come to Boston and to have this chance, I said to myself, why in the world have I done this with so many crises and so many things on our desk? What am I going to do visiting Boston Thursday afternoon? But I'm really thrilled that uh, I was uh, persuaded to keep the commitment and to be here, even though uh, technology didn't allow me to really cut the, the link back to New York and to the rest of the world. People still uh, chased me while I was waiting to, to meet with you all. And it's, it's really a, a great source of a positive energy to be able to be here today and to maybe tell you a bit my story, but more than my story, what I think it is a, a, the, the, the huge opportunity that each one of you has in, in your own life and in your own career. And just to briefly say to you, um, I as, as it was said already, I am a, an electronics. In my, in my times, this is long time ago, in centuries ago, there was not electronics engineer. So I was an electrical engineer specialized in electronics. That's the title I have. But was at that time the closest you could get to electronics engineer. And I, we were just talking with the professor about you know, percentage of women in class and all of that. I was the only one in class. So that made my life very easy, you know, they, all of them and me. And they called me Pedro. So I was Pedro to them, which was their way to welcome me to their community, but I was really foreign. You know, I was a foreigner in their community and then they had the, somehow the, the touch to allow me in the community and again, 
to welcome me as Pedro. <laughs> that meant that uh, the code of uh, conduct was an absolutely male con code, code of conduct. And, and that's how I was raised and how I learned to live in this tough world of a female, sorry, male dominated tough world where I think a, one can prove that there are huge opportunities for women and of course today even more so and particularly there are huge opportunities for women that always bring a different perspective. And I think that is something that I would like to, to emphasize that I believe has been the baseline in which I constructed my whole life. The fact that you always can bring a different perspective and that uh, the gender differentiation is important when you come together, together as teams because that different perspective adds value to whatever the end result is that you are seeking to achieve. So that is how I started being Pedro in the engineering school. Then I finished uh, and became an engineer and was trying to get my first job. And um, at that time I was a, a, a teacher assistant in, at the university while I was still studying. And one of the professors there whom I was working with uh, recommended me to a big European company who was looking for graduates from engineering to start a career. And this was a very large, very interesting company. So he sent my CV there saying, you know, I recommend this young, just a, a new engineer. I think she can do good in, in what you're trying to do. In parallel, I sent my CV to IBM. And IBM had this big ad in, on the paper uh, seeking for graduates also, saying a male slash female, we are an equal opportunity employer. So I thought I had a chance in IBM, but also I thought, given the fact that this professor of mine had recommended me, and he was the director of a, one of the largest companies in Argentina, he was the director of, of maintenance in that company, and this European company, of, of course, was a supplier, so I also stand a big chance with this supplier. They will, not, they will want to be nice to my friend, the professor. So, these two companies were in Buenos Aires, and there is one minor correction to my CV. I wasn't born in Buenos Aires, I was born in Rosario, which is the second largest city of Argentina. But I knew that I would eventually move to Buenos Aires in my professional life. So here I go to have a series of interviews with the company never to be named, the European company, and um, they, I, they, they pay my trip to Buenos Aires, and they, you know, one interview, two interviews, and I get to the fifth interview. And the very sa same day that I have the fifth interview with this company, I have my first interview in IBM. So I go to the interview, and it is with the HR director, with the human resources director, and he tells me, well, you know, I'm afraid we will not be able to offer you the job because you are a woman. So I look at the guy and said, listen, wouldn't it be nice for you to read my CV? Because if you had read my CV, it would have been clear that I was a woman when I wrote it. <laughs> so maybe it would have been more practical for you and for me not to lose time and just to tell me no because you're a woman before we all started this journey. What had happened is that they were trying to justify through other means to my professor friend recommended me that they couldn't hire me because of some lack of skills, knowledge, whatever, and they just couldn't find it. So in the end, they told me straight what the reason was, and that was I was a woman. And I said, you know, there were many things I could do for you and change for you, that I can. So I got very upset and I left the place and, you know, I'm, I'm high temper, so I wasn't enjoying myself that day. That afternoon, I had my first interview in IBM. And I said, well, at least I know they're not going to say anything about me being a woman because their own a, a message said, we are an equal opportunity company. 
So I go, I have this meeting. I had already gone through some, some uh, writing tests and all of that, which I had obviously passed. I have this interview, and the person who interviews me says, what do you want to be in IBM? And I honestly had no clue. I just wanted to start working, you know, but I didn't think that would sound good. So I tried to be smart and say, well, you know, I think I would like to be a salesperson because in the IBM always sounded like big on sales. He looked at me and said, a salesperson? But you're a woman. Oh my God. I was all over the guy. I mean it seriously. I really lost it. And I said, you are disrespectful. You say that you're an equal opportunity company. And I went on and on and on and on. I remember leaving the building and calling my husband, we were just married, and telling him, well, I lost two job opportunities. One because I was a woman, the second one because I blew it. <laughs> so they called me again from IBM, and long story short, I got into IBM as, as a trainee. And nine months later, the very same person who said to me, a salesperson, a woman, offered me to be the first salesperson, women salesperson in IBM Argentina. So I have experienced for many, many years, and you don't want to know how many, I don't want to tell you either, I have experienced this notion of breaking the, the crystal ceiling. And um, I just can tell you, you can do it. All of you can do it. And all of you can do it no matter what minority perspective somebody may have on, on you, if you really try hard, if you really are convinced, if you really go for it, you can make it. That's the first message I would like to, to share with you. And it was, I had a very interesting 25 year, and this is the first number I'm going to give you, and since all of you are close to math and science, you'll make up very fast how old I am. Um, I worked for 25 years in the private sector and I, I had a very good career. All of that essentially in technology. I was almost 15 years in IBM and then I was 10 years in Telecom Argentina, which at the time was a company that was owned by the government and was privatized in the 90s and uh, it was bought by, by two big European companies, and I went into it uh, in the operational side of the, of the company. So I ran operations for Telecom Argentina, and after a few years, I became the CEO of a company. So I was the CEO of the third largest company of Argentina, which was yet another breakthrough. And I always remember when, when the uh, shareholders, the main shareholders, European, France Telecom and Telecom Italia, called the Argentinian shareholder to say, would it be proper in the Argentinian market to appoint a, a woman CEO? The local shareholder said, well, maybe that will not go down too well, except for Susana, which again is a way to, to to make an exception that, in my view, is not a real exception. It's a way to justify for the ones who still want to keep the club that maybe they are ready to open up the door every now and then. And there, another lesson is that when you seize the opportunity, when the door is open, you need to prove how much you can contribute, how much you can bring that different perspective. And soon, the case is made that you are there because you have the skills, because you have the experience, because you have the right a set of, of a, a, a skills that make a difference. So never feel downplayed because people say that. It's just, it's their problem, it's not your problem. You go for it. I was in, as I said, in telecom for 10 years until in 2001, at the end of 2001, and you probably, none of you know this or remember this, 
there was a big crisis in my country and um, there was a huge devaluation and the company I was running got into chapter 11. So I had the privilege to come to, to Wall Street. It's, it is a, a, a listed company in the stock ex exchange in New York, also in London and also in, in Tokyo. So I had the privilege to tour the capitals to tell the investors that the company was going into chapter 11. It was one of the most difficult moments in my life, you know, something in which you have worked so much, invested so much, having to explain that, you know, it's essentially having to reinvent itself because it's going into chapter 11. It was really, really very difficult. And a few months later, during 2002, the board decided that, uh, you know, they needed a different profile of a CEO at that time, that they wanted somebody with a background in finance, and they offered me a package to leave, which was one horrible moment because I didn't want a package to leave. I wanted to stay and do something. But of course, you know how boards are, they decide, and I went. And it took me a little bit of time to adjust and to get over this sense of frustration that something that you were doing didn't go well, the sense of, of you know, responsibility for having failed. And in, during that period where I was between jobs and what you do when you are between jobs, you are consultant, so I was doing a little bit of consultancy and working with companies and all of that, doing a little bit of business, I came to realize that I was done with the private sector that I had proven myself, if I wanted to prove myself, that I had done what I could done, and the likelihood that I will be inspired enough to continue to do something in the private sector was very, very low. So at that point I thought, well, maybe an NGO would be the place for me to be. I have a strong management background. I have run large companies, uh, just to give you a sense, Telecom Argentina had 25,000 employees, so it was a large company. And I said, well, maybe I, there is something I can do that can, using my, my, my talent, using my experience, using my ex skills, I can offer to a totally different a, a market. So I started to think about that. And it was in the end of, at the end of 2003 that an organization within the United Nations World Food Program. It's the largest humanitarian organization that takes care of, of people who don't have food, essentially. Um, was looking for a Latin American woman. And, and I explained to you in a second why that came about. Um, and they were doing it through a headhunter. And the headhunter it was, of course, an international uh, search reached out to me and said whether well, I, I would be interested in it. I looked into the website, it, seemed, it came across as interesting, and I said, why not? The reason why they were looking for a Latin American woman, and I learned that only after being involved, is that in the UN, not only we are very strong at trying to hit gender balance, but also we need to be very, very, very uh, attuned to geographic diversity. And the leadership of, of World Food Program had representation from the different regions, but didn't have anybody from Latin America. And they, since they were going to go after a, a leader coming from Latin America, they wanted somebody who was a woman, because that will also help the gender balance. So long story short, 11 interviews after, the executive director called me to say, if you are still interested, the job is yours. And that's how I came to discover what the United Nations is. And it has been the most marvelous journey that one can have. I started to work in World Food Program on September, September the 4th, 2004. So I just uh, hit the 10 year mark a couple of months ago. I was, of course, I didn't understand anything. The, the, the language, the acronym, the expressions, nothing. Everything was foreign to me. 
I was based in Rome, that's where the World Food Program is, because FAO is in Rome and everything that is related to food in the, in the UN is based in Rome. So I, I was trying to get myself acquainted with the organization when comes December, comes Christmas time, and of course everybody leaves to go and visit the family and be home, and they leave the rookie in town, which is me, in charge of everything. And they say, well, uh, we are going to leave you. And I say, well, I don't think it's a good idea. You know, I haven't been here long enough. So I say, well, don't worry. And this famous phrase, I will never forget. <laughs> it's the last week of the year. Nothing happens. <laughs> and guess what? The tsunami hit. So I was in charge of the response to the tsunami, at least the first phase of the response to the tsunami bringing people from all over the world to deploy to these multiple countries, because if you remember, the, it was a multiple country uh, uh, response. And it was an incredible experience to see how the system came together to react and to answer to the response, even within that difficult period between Christmas and New Year's, and how the, our, our team came together and we were able to to deploy in, in a question of hours and a couple of days. So that was my first experience. I really worked hard. The World Food Program has presence in about 80 countries. I, I discovered Africa. It's, it was one of the most amazing experiences to discover Africa. And in 2008, the Secretary General in, in fact, in 2007, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon came uh, uh, to office, and the first thing he asked member states is that he wanted to divide the peacekeeping operations, which is us, you, I'm sure you know, one of the largest the flagships of the United Nations, divide them in two. One, the military political side, and the other one, the management logistics side, and create a new department. After a lot of uh, discussions within the General Assembly, they approved it. And it was at the beginning of 2008 that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon offered me to come and lead this new department. So I moved to New York and I worked for three years and a half in the deployment of the largest peacekeeping operations that we have, like the one in the poor Central African Republic, you know, work in, in, in Somalia with the African Union, in the Congo, in, in the big, big period of Sudan evolving to the referendum to become two Sudans. I, I led the referendum that made the, that division possible. So it was a very interesting experience. And again, to my surprise, when uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon started his second term, he asked me to be his chief of staff. Chef de cabinet means chief of staff in, in, in plain English. So I've been his chief of staff almost for three years now, which again was a total shift because from being in charge of the department and being essentially an operational person, I became his shadow, uh, managing the house from behind the scenes and making sure that the trains run on time, if at all possible. Uh, you know, looking at the, the decision process and the decision making of the center of the world. So it has been an amazing, amazing uh, journey in which I learn every single day something. And that's the other lesson, always be prepared to learn. Because the minute you don't learn anymore, then you are dead. Just be ready to learn and be prepared to wear a suit that is maybe two sizes too large for you and work your muscles and fit yourself and learn so that you fit into your suit better. And be very careful when the suit starts to look like it's too tight. It's time to, time to move on. Never get complacent with yourself. Always look for something more challenging. And eventually, be ready to 
sell the waters. Often the opportunities will be there, and this is particularly important for my female colleagues here. Often you'll have opportunities in which you will feel you are not totally prepared. Trust yourself. Trust your instinct. Allow yourself to dare into the waters and sell them. Because if you work hard, if you excel, if you really push yourself, there's no doubt you're going to make it. So those are the lessons I have learned. Uh, I have a dossier on my desk, which is essentially the dossier that the Secretary General manages. Everything from political, peace and security, development, human rights, uh, sustainable development, energy, you name it. So if there is anything you will want me to talk about in particular, I'd be ready to, to do it. I think at this point in time, instead of continuing a monologue, I'd much rather have a conversation. And I, I love to see uh, women already going like that, because that will be much better, and I will uh, steer the conversation to the places you want to have it. So you go first. Well, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have been following Secretary General's bond view on, on, on climate change. If there has been an advocate on this issue, if there's one thing I would say he should be remembered for is precisely his continuous advocacy for, climate, for the climate change related questions. It's a dramatically difficult issue because it's an issue where leaders need to rise above their own boundaries, their own domestic politics. And this is something that is very difficult for leaders in the world, particularly when, when the, the cycle is a cycle of downturn in economic questions, that the financial crisis put a lot of challenges there. So, for leaders to be forward-leaning and, again, stand above is very difficult. You just saw the decision of the European Union, which is very interesting, and their commitment that was just taken, and it's particularly interesting because this decision was in the hands of the, economic, in the European Union for the last six, seven months, and they postponed the decision until after the elections because they wanted to make sure that the new commission and the new parliament will embrace this decision so that it will not be challenged in the change because there, there was also an expectation of a movement to a more conservative environment. And um, they were able to agree to this 40% reduction. So, I mean, it's, it's an ambitious, a objective which I think will keep the momentum into the discussions that are taking place among member states that hopefully will go to Lima and allow for a first draft to be agreed and again in, 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 in Paris next year when they finally meet they will sign a legally binding agreement. This requires the US and China to play ball big time. The Europeans have come forward and for the developing world to also, and particularly some key members in the developing world like India, Brazil, and, and South Africa to really, really a, a stand above and, and realize that a growth in economic terms should not be contradictory to a good climate change policy. So that's essentially where we stand. It's hard because it's not for the Secretary General to dictate, he just can the only thing he can do is corral and push and talk and advocate. But in the end, is President Obama, is the President of China, is uh, uh, President Rousseff, President Zuma, the ones who have to decide. 
and it's very important for the people to raise their, their voices. Yes. Um, considering that for the last three years it's been a shadow, and for the first, specifically for the first seven years, it was kind of your piece of a lie. I'm curious why we haven't heard a tip out of the United Nations about Putin's aggression in Ukraine and why United Nations forces has not been peacekeeping there. Well, essentially because the, the European Union and OSCE took the lead on this. And, and that was a decision by member states. The Security Council has, a, 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 and as you know, um, in peace and security matters, this is something that they say is in the hands of the Security Council. They essentially uh, put it in the hands of OSCE to handle. We are supporting OSCE, we are supporting OSCE with a lot of a, a, a specific a knowledge and, and skills. We, are, we have a, given them many of our monitors that are under a OSCE flag, but the decision of member states was not to have this in the hands of, of the United Nations. Having said that, the, the Secretary General has expressed himself very often, last time yesterday, talking about the, the elections that are going to take place on November the 2nd, he had his last statement from yesterday afternoon. But it's not always the case that the United Nations is there to do something. Sometimes it's the African Union, like in Somalia, and that's how, members, how the Security Council has decided. Yes. Um, I have a kind of a follow-up question to that. I'm just kind of curious. Uh, when the UN catches wind that a conflict may be coming up or may start to escalate, for instance, as an example, like Operation Protective Edge with uh, Israel and Palestine, what is, can you kind of walk us through the decision tree in terms of once it becomes apparent that something could or is likely to start to happen, what types of decisions, what types of actions you guys start to sort of hash over? Well, uh, you gave a very specific example where the UN is very vested because, as you know, the UN is, has all kinds of presence in that part of the world with different, different tasking. So uh, it's not that we catch wind. We probably are in the middle of the wind when things happen. In other places, we catch wind, and I can talk about that. Uh, uh, the, the biggest challenge we have, and I, I think uh, is, is one of the things in which a Secretary General Ban sometimes is frustrated, is the lack of ability to have a early warning signs really making an impact. And this goes to the, to the heart of the decision process where the Security Council is unlikely to activate itself only on early warning. And that's, that's one of our, our real, real uh, uh, limitations, you know. How to make early warning signs really activate all protocols. Uh, and, and you see this happening in, in Africa very often. Uh, one of the things that we have started recently is a human rights at front initiative, which is an initiative in which we are trying through human rights violations, be able sort of have a proxy of something that may happen through human rights violations. And we're trying to do a scanning through human rights violations that are very, very objective. I mean, you measure them and say, listen, this is getting to the threshold where something wrong Something will go wrong here. And um, it's, it's a way to, to, be, to systematize and have more objective measures. To, because when you cross this boundary of the sovereign government, you have to have ways to prove your case. Remember that the United Nations is, is an organization of member states, of sovereign member states. So it's not that you step into their internal business just because you feel like it. You have to make a case. 
So one of the things, again, that a, 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 a Secretary General Biden is trying to do is this linkage between human rights violations and the potential of something bigger coming. Because when you look at history, most of the big, big things that have happened, have gone wrong, started with human rights violations. So that's what we are trying to do. Prevention at large is, is one of the themes that Secretary General is trying to, to, to invest on, not only in peace and security, but also in, 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 in natural disasters, you know, work on prevention, because if you do that well, it's much, much easier to, to invest less and get return. Yes, please. Thank you for sharing your great story. I'm really interested in your personal story. And uh, it seems that you always uh, pioneered uh, in um, some challenges and for some changes in your life. And what is the most important thing you consider whenever you change something, you, you, you uh, face some new things. So what is the most driving motivation? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I trust my, my instinct quite a lot. I, I, you know, sometimes I have been offered things and I just felt, don't touch it, don't go there. And others try to persuade you. And I, I as time has passed and I have age, I became more comfortable in trusting my instinct. So that's one thing I do. Second, I trust my husband a lot. So I have the, you know, the a beauty of having a good family and a husband who has been a companion throughout this whole journey. So I always listen to him also because he's very grounded. So I, I hear him and then I go for it. Just go for it. And you know, the thing, this notion of sitting at the desk the first day, whatever it is, I mean, I remember this when I was a trainee in IBM, and feeling that life is coming onto your shoulder and you will not be able to do it. And why in the world am I here? What did I do? Why did I, ex all those emotions, just build on those emotions and make it work. I think that's essentially it. And I have gone through that. That's why I use the, 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 the equivalent of the, the, the suit being too, a, a sizes too large. It's, it's that notion of daring, try it. I'm, I'm not suggesting here be crazy. I mean, there are certain basic things that you, you need to comply with and feel comfortable with. But just go for that extra mile. I think that's, that's the most important thing. Yes? Hi. Um, I'm curious to know your opinion on the Yeah, I'm just curious to know your opinion on is it possible and is it desirable to enlarge the UN Security Council? Do you think, I know it's an issue that's been debated upon for long, but do you think it's desirable? Do you think it's possible and will it? happen eventually? Oh, there are, those are many questions, all of them different. First, I, I think the, the Security Council it was established in a totally different context. You know, and, and the reality of today, this was the post-World War II context uh, where the, the, the winners of the war were represented one way or the other and uh, the balance of power was totally different. So it is clear that if the United Nations is to reflect the realities, an evolving reality, which today is something and 50 years will be something different, we should find a way to adapt the architecture of the organization to that evolving reality. So that's the principle, that's the philosophy. How do you do that in a context where you have a 15 members, five of which have a veto power, to persuade them to give up the veto power is something very difficult. 
But on the other side of the spectrum, how do you agree to enlarge and who goes in there? Is it permanent, semi-permanent, veto, non-veto? And then you start to see that from the, uh, uh, the ones who are aspiring to come in, there are different views and some of them contradict themselves. That's the reason why nothing has happened in the many, after many years of many discussions. I think in the end, and hopefully in, in not much time, something will happen. But it's a, it's a very tough decision to how you reshape the Security Council. And uh, what is interesting about the United Nations is that as much criticism as there is about the United Nations and its lack of ability to do things fast and while people are talking there, it's less likely that they will be fighting somewhere else. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's how to make that machinery work in a better manner reflecting the realities of today is, is the challenge that member states have and they have to decide how much value they give to the United Nations in order to, to, to reshape themselves. I think they should, in the end, and hopefully sooner than later, that will happen. Yes? Hi. Um, thank you for taking us through this interesting trajectory from your experience in engineering to business to the UN. Um, I'm curious how, especially between being a business leader and being more of a policy leader now in the UN, what did you have to learn new? What kind of changes did you have to, I guess, making yourself to become successful, transferring from being a business leader to being more of a policy leader? Well, the first thing I, I believe is the fact that I got to a point where I decided that I, I, my cycle in business had finished. You know, you have to go through that internal transformation. You don't go to the UN to earn money. So uh, the first thing is that you have to have crossed that boundary for whatever reason, you know, and I, I did after the, as I said, the big crisis in 2001. Uh, what I didn't tell you, and, and maybe it's, it's good that I mention this now, is that when I was at university, uh, it was the, the obscure period of the juntas in Argentina. So I was, a, a, a delegate as, as a student, so I was very active in politics. And for some reason, I, was, I did not disappear. It's one of the things I will never totally, totally understand. But I know I was very close there. What happened when, when the, the dictatorship took over is one of two things for people who were very active. One was, People disappear, so they just were not there any longer. Others, like was my case, shy away from politics from their own. So you dedicated yourself to something different. But somewhere in you, there was something missing still. So I guess what happened to me when, when, when I crossed the threshold in the private sector is that I went back to this notion of doing something different. And that's what the United Nations gave me. It's an opportunity not to do politics, but to do policy. And um, I think I, I came full circle, if I could say it. On the other hand, it has been a huge challenge because nothing that you learn in the private sector prepares you for the United Nations. Particularly when you have management responsibilities, and I have had a lot of management responsibilities. You know, um, this, this notion of a, having a clear chain of command where you instruct and people follow your instructions, none of that happens in the United Nations. You build consensus, you advise, you suggest, you try to, again, corral people, and out of all that process, you hope that you get to the right place. So it requires a, 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 a flexibility an openness that is totally different. So you have to retool yourself, which is fantastic. That's, that's, I find that, you know, I, I, 
I really think that, and just to give you more details on age, I, I got into WFP at 49 years old. So the fact that at that age you decide to throw your, your whole career and start and, 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 and give it a try to something so different, it's just refreshing. And the notion that being so prescriptive, being so sure of yourself, being so definite, being so secure that things are right or wrong, left or right, up or down, that all of that is not like that. That you know, there are multiple views, multiple options, multiple cultures. That's just great, and that's, I think, what, what I have learned. Yes? I was wondering what kind of qualities and skills made you stand out as a candidate for a chef de cabinet? Oh, you asked that to the Secretary General. <laughs> Let me tell you, um, I tried to persuade the Secretary General that I was not the right person for, for her, his chief of cabinet, uh, his chief of staff. Um, I, I, I don't know, I think probably, um, you know, SG and I met each other when I came to peacekeeping operations. I was working in Rome, and when I came to work in peacekeeping operations in the Department of Field Support, we started to work together. So I, I, I'm, I'm not an inner circle person from the Secretary General. I mean, we, we don't have a long history together. I think just delivering, doing things in a professional way, and, and, and being very straight and very focused, and very much geared towards getting things done is what he probably saw in me and, and that's why he decided to offer me this. But the rest he has to speak, I cannot talk about it. <laughs> yes. on leadership. I, I'm sure that in the day-to-day uh, -day operations at the United Nations, uh, whether at headquarters or in the field, there will be decisions, uh, big or small, that need to be made. And eventually, they could make a big difference. But how much uh, do you recommend as a leader, effective leader, to incorporate your personal feelings, your own judgment um, into those decisions as opposed to withholding your, your personal ethical values and just try to make you know, things to work collater um, like collater collectively. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of compromises and there will be decisions made that um, it's probably right for the big group, but not so right for individual person groups or individual nations. So how do you come to a compromise in yourself of those differences such that you can carry out the day-to-day -day operation? Well, you are talking about the deep philosophy of life. Um, it's not only in the United maybe. Nations. <laughs> well. I am of the view that one cannot park oneself when you, you get into your job in the morning, in whatever office it is that you are going to be working. You are there with your own self. So I don't believe that you can separate what you believe, what you feel, what you are, from what you do. I just don't believe it. And I think it's, you know, it's true there are compromises and you have to have the flexibility, as I said before, to, to garner support, to bring people together. But I also believe there are certain limits to how much you can compromise. And my personal view, and I have done that in the past, is when the line that you have to follow is too far from what you believe, what you are, what you think, then you just have to leave. So I deeply believe that people do make a difference that we are not in automatic processes where you push a button and things happen, no. And I think that's very important. And one needs to be very, con very consistent with one beliefs 
and just really try to align the decision to those beliefs. That doesn't mean that you think you are above the rest, but it's very hard to live with yourself when you go back home if you have taken decisions that are totally opposite to your principles and to your views. So um, that's maybe another lesson that I could say, answering this question you know, I can give you. If you feel that you're pushing too much against your own convictions, just look for new options. It's time. Okay. Yes. Um, based on your experience as a student in Argentina and the violation of human rights and trying to fight for um, political rights, can you draw parallels between your experience and the experience that university students may be having right now in Venezuela and um, how that may be resolved, the violation of human rights there? Well, first of all, um, my experience at that time was a little bit more extreme than what we are seeing in Venezuela. I have, well, I'm, 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 not, going, I'm not going to start a fight comparing the two of them. I tell you, uh, I live in Argentina in the times where the world wasn't even aware that something was happening in Argentina. Uh, it's a little bit different, I can assure you. Of course, there are very, very strong internal tensions in, in Venezuela, and uh, our human rights uh, commissioner is looking into that. But again, that's where you get into this question somebody else had asked earlier on, you asked earlier on, about how do you uh, monitor, how do you check, how do you get to the early warnings, and the human rights violations is the main element to determine whether there is something happening that should require an intervention of some sort. That's exactly what our human rights uh, commission is, is doing. The monitoring? Of course, it happens all over the world, not only in Venezuela. Will something be done? <laughs> what do you mean by will be something be done? Because the other thing that also requires a, a, a recognition is that people have to own their own destiny and have to raise to that. There is one delicate balance and having gone through that process from inside and seen it from outside in many places, there is a delicate balance between the United Nations being the solver of all problems on a white horse and the ownership by the people of the countries to raise to their own challenges. So sometimes you can raise a flag and say, listen, here things are not really going well, which the UN does very often. Another one is for the UN to step in and solve the problems on behalf of the people. That doesn't work. You cannot outsource to anybody the solution of the problems of a country. Only the people of that country can solve it. I kind of have a continuation of what you just said. Um, the scenes of you from inside and outside. What could have United Nations have done at the times that you were a student to help Argentina? Well, again, raising the, the flag of, of the violations that were taking place. Uh, at that time, it was for years, this was essentially not recognized. Times are very different. Today, on, 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 through social media, we are essentially seeing online, you know, what people tape with their, with their telephones. Uh, this is, these were times, just to give you a sense, I was in the middle of it at university. People whom I knew well disappeared, and we knew they disappeared. We knew that they were taken, but some, somehow you create yourself this fantasy that, well, they will become, it's a self-protection fantasy. They will be coming back, maybe, you know, maybe they, they did something, but they will be released. Uh, and, and it's not that it happened once, it happened once, twice, three, and this was unknown to the world, wasn't recognized. Only until the moment that the OAS took some upon itself later on, 
And some European countries, because there were people who were living in Argentina and were raising it, something started to, to, to take root. And it was in 78, when we had the World Cup, that the, the, the Junta itself had to prove that, well, maybe they were not, you know, they, they were not so bad. So they started to open a little bit for investigation. But um, it, it, was, it was really extreme, extreme closure for years. Reality today is that through, through technology, through, proxim through the proximity that technology provides, uh, uh, doing things without anybody noticing is, is very, very unlikely. That doesn't mean that by the fact that you know, it is noticed somewhere else, automatically it will be solved. But there is a big difference from what it was in, in the 70s, 60s and 70s. Okay, so I think um, we probably have time for one more question. Does anyone? There's one there. Maybe two. That one there uh, and one we there. We have two more. One here. <laughs> Thanks so much for your insight and your terrific uh, work with the UN. I was wondering if you have any thoughts to share on UN Women, which oh, is yeah. a relatively new part of the UN. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because it does seem like we're in a time after, you know, clearly many successes for women throughout history, but also lots of exclusion. It seems like we're getting a lot of messaging from the United Nations, from UN Women as an entity, and then from a lot of people in various governments around the world that's sort of supportive and positive about women and, gr and girls uh, in new ways. And so I'm wondering if you, if you have any thoughts on that since you bring you know, a, a pretty well-rounded and also sort of insider perspective to the UN. Well, first of all, the, the, the creation of UN Women is a great, great opportunity. As you may know, uh, the UN Women is the merge of many inst different entities that existed within the UN, but we had a lesser standing. So they all came together as one organization with a very strong head. The first was the, the president of Chile now. Uh, Michelle Bachelet was the first uh, executive director of UN Women. It's, it's, a, a, it's a great landmark for the United Nations to, to really make the case for women and girls. And I have to say also, as, as I mentioned before, Secretary General Barn being, remember, for climate change. Women is another very, very important element in his agenda. Just to give you a sense, 40% of the leadership of the United Nations are women. So he has really, really made a lot in that regard. We, UN Women is working hard to make the case. El next year is Beijing plus 20. So um, this is a very interesting milestone. And let me share with you very interestingly, uh, there were, uh, some were suggesting that in the celebration of Beijing plus 20, the agenda established in Beijing should be reopened and rediscussed to move it forward. And many, and I'm talking member states here, advise against that because there is a risk to move it backwards. So for women who feel very safe, very secure, that feel that the rights have been conquered, be careful. In many parts of the world, many parts of the world, things are moving in the wrong direction. So we, we need to keep working on this agenda. We need to keep working, making the case. You know, a Secretary General says, has a phrase that I like very much, which is a phrase about a extremist and terrorist, and, and he says, you know, that a, a, a terrorist can be killed by a gun, but only books can kill terrorism, and only books in the hands of girls can make a real difference. So, you know, it's, it's a very, very strong message, and I, I think that we need to push this, and UN Women is very strong in doing so. Okay, great. And then we have our last question over here. Yeah, thank you very much for, for sharing with us all these experiences and all this perspective. I have a follow-up from a previous question when you were mentioning that it's so important to bring a new perspective. Uh, and I wonder how your 
perspective as a woman and, and your perspective as someone who have had also experience in the private sector have helped you now in your current task in the UN? Oh, uh, of course, it, it helps. It helps uh, a lot because, you know, you are as rounded as your experiences. And and you know, I sit with colleagues that mostly come from foreign service. Many of them have been ambassadors or members of their their you know State Department foreign service or in the political arena. So I, I always have a complementary perspective. I have learned a lot, absolutely. I mean, I, I have a much broader view, a much larger perspective, but in the end, I also, I'm, I'm also my own story, you know, my own history. So um, I, I think that one thing that we always need to do is build on what we are. It's just one, one last comment before we wrap up. Often we try to work on our weaknesses and try to do everything to reduce our weaknesses. That is a huge investment, most likely with very low return. Build on your strength. So when you, like in my case, you know, I'm, I haven't been a politician, so I'm not going to try and build based on a political experience or trying to to fool that I am a politician. I'm not, but I have a different path that has taken me here, and I build on that. And I think that's something that each one of us, is, is good that we do, that we build on our strength. Each one of us has a strength. Each one of us has weaknesses. Just, of course, try to do something about the weaknesses. I'm not saying just forget about them, but really invest on your strength. Because then the, 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 the quantum that you can achieve in results is much higher. So I think we are getting pretty much to the end. It has been a great pleasure to be here. It has been great to, to have the opportunity for an hour, a little bit more, forget about some of the issues that are in my uh, iPhone, and to, have a, to see so many young faces with such a great future. You are in, 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 in an outstanding institution. Being at this university is a privilege. Don't forget that. And um, really build on, on what you are getting here because that will make a big difference in what you do towards the future. So congratulations to you all.